Okay, here we are. Another day, another video. Uh, welcome to my channel, if you haven't been here before. I hope you can first do me a favor, that is uh, smash that notification bell and uh, leave a comment and give a thumbs up because it's very important for my algorithm. This is a new channel and I'm trying to get into the algorithm, so that will really help. Now, uh, today is my 53rd birthday. I was born on 2nd of April 1968. 1968 and it is strange because I'm wondering what happened to 22 32 42 and then 52 and now 53 and it is so weird to see how time just seems to slip away so I decided tonight for once to have a glass of wine and I haven't been drinking wine since New Year's Eve I had like three or four glasses of wine on New Year's Eve and I've been drinking like one glass <laughs> and this is the second one and I can really hit feel that it hits like a mule so uh, pardon my French as they say because this is going to be an interesting experience. Now, I know my dear mother is going to hate this because I'm going to. The first topic I'm going to talk about is a word that I have been discussing with my parents, not my parents, my mother, for years. I think it must be 30 years or 25 years, at least 25 years. And I'm trying to explain to my mother that talent is a thing, okay, talent is a thing you say somebody have when they have done all the dirty work, all the use, all that time, all that energy, put in all this uh, time consuming work to become a little bit better than the average. Now, to become better than average is quite great because most people are basically average or less. They are not living up to their poten potential. Now, I wouldn't say the God-given potential because I'm an atheist. So I just say potential, human potential. My mother has taunted me with this thing that I have a talent for uh, seeing color. Now my mother absolutely have aesthetic sense and she has a talent, kind of talent for, probably a talent for seeing colors and shapes and structure and symmetry and so does my daughter actually uh, but we wouldn't have known that if she was never able to get into a situation where she could actually evolve this talent and the same thing goes for me I started out as a young naive welder who was uh, training uh, karate and weights and chasing girls and doing my welding and then I had a girlfriend who is called Heidi which was a little bit annoyed that I was um, uh, spending a little much too time on cafes and because we had these layoffs, because it wasn't that much work and I was laid off and not laid off, but you had to kind of go into this paid leave. And I was spending too much time in cafes and doing all kinds of bullshit. And she threw me a pen, actually a, a lead pen, not like this pen. And she said, get a hobby, start 
drawing or something. And one of the first drawings I did, and I was basically 1920-ish, I don't really remember, was of this girl from a photo. I think it was from a photo. But this was the first drawing I did when I was 20 or 21, something like that. And if anyone in the world would look at this drawing, which I was actually totally pleased with, I was so impressed by myself, but a glimmer in her eye. And I just fell in love with the feeling, probably of accomplishment, probably uh, the flow. I remember when I started drawing, I got back to the childish flow, that thing that calmed me down. But I mean, I couldn't draw at all, at all. Okay, and everybody who sees this drawing has to agree with me. So, no one in the world would say, look at this drawing and say that this guy has talent. There is just no way that anyone would do that. Luckily for me, I was probably suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect because... I actually thought this was a good drawing, okay? I was pleased with this drawing. And that says a lot about the state of mind I was in at that time. How little I actually, how little introspection I actually, actually had looking at this drawing and thinking that this was a great thing. Now, I could actually discuss with myself, I can see the expressionist in myself, I can see the extreme personality in myself, you know, in it. It is kind of, it is, it is no compromises here. It just, the lines and everything is just all in, okay? And that is the kind of personality I have. But nobody, as I say, would say that this guy has a talent for becoming an artist, okay? When I was a child, I was a very... I've always been a very creative person. I made my own guns, I made my own rockets, I almost blew my head off with it. I, um, I was out in nature, I built my own um, uh, tanks with all these you know, animals in, and you know, I did, I was a creative child, but I couldn't draw. I, I stopped drawing. When I started chasing girls, like when I was a 10, 11, 12, something like that, I probably stopped chasing, stopped drawing, because I remember I used to draw when I was a child, but every child draws, so how the hell? But anyway, after one year, it must be one year, one or two years, one year of drawing school and one year in art school because me and that girl that started this, Heidi, we broke up about 1991, 92 maybe and that was the first year in art school. Uh, I don't really know when I draw this but I draw this of the same girl a couple of years after. And she was doing, sitting as a model for me. And then I have to say, it actually started to become something. So why did I actually go from this to this in a year or two? Well, was it because I had a talent for drawing? I would say no. There is no way. But I have a talent for hard work and focus. And that is basically what I see in other artists and scientists and everything that 
what you need to become better at something is to have the extreme passion for what you do. And I always had that. I became a quite a good welder. I became uh, quite good in karate. I became quite good in taekwondo. I actually had a double hip replacement in 2019 because I've been training way too much for 40 years. And I uh, went through a hell of a lot of pain and stuff and it was really hard. But I became good at the things that I cared about. Uh, there are things you just can't teach me. You can't make me become interested in football. You can't make me become interested in fashion. I'm very interested in aesthetics and my daughter is actually doing uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, making clothes or designing clothes and stuff and she's really good. But she's making her own thing. She's not following in trends or anything. She's just mixing styles like me to create something that is hers. And I'm really impressed by it. But what we do have, what we might have talent for, is the extreme. And there's number two comes in because I wrote down these cue cards this time. So I know what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's the artist brain. I could also add, of course, I could add the artist and science, science, science brain. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I cannot, the artist and the scientific brain. What is the driving force of the artist and scientific brain? Well, I have a couple of diagnoses. I have the typical ADHD brain. I'm always on. I am probably a little bit bipolar. I am not going into this deep um, long-term depression or long-term highs. It's more like every day when I wake up, it is like being, I wake up to, an, to a, some kind of an existential crisis where I have to deal with, uh, it's almost like I'm getting reality slapped right into my face like a big fat fish, okay, smelly fish. And I just have to deal with it after I wake up. And, and sometimes I wake up happy, some, but most days I wake up in this existential crisis. And that is due to what I call the artistic brain. The artistic brain is a little bit more extreme than the average brain. But as I usually say, we are born into a bipolar situation. Because as Darwin did say, I think it was Darwin who said that we bear the stamp of our lower origin. And there is a conflict in our brain between the old system, the, the, the system for, uh, that goes for sex and food and short buzz, and the new brain, the one who gives us this deep possibility not everybody does it, but the possibility for a deep introspection, which actually is the thing that makes us human. I'm not degrading any human being, but the less you're using, using introspection and, and deep thinking, the less human you actually are. Because what actually makes you human is deep thought. Any animal thinks, it just doesn't know that it thinks. And when I look at the world, how the world looks, I would say that most people doesn't even know they are thinking. And that is, you can see it in the way they act, they can see it in the way they treat themselves, they, you can see how they are treating other people, the pettiness, the tribalism, the, the overeating, the overuse of resources, and the lack of self-control. And I have been 
massively out of control. And I'm suffering for it. I have got into trouble because of my curiosity, because of my creativity. I have basically ruined possibilities for myself because of this artistic brain. But this artistic brain is also what gives me the possibility to stand hours and hours after hours and twinkle small things in it. You know, I just posted an onion video on my YouTube channel. I can stand there for hours and hours and just fight with these smallest things, which nobody actually cares about. But for me, it is pure existentialism. If I can't get this right, I am devastated. And the problem is that with that kind of a brain, you will also take that manic part of you, that hypomanic part of you, and if you start doing the wrong things, you get equally good, good at doing the wrong things. So you wind up in trouble, okay? And I have my share of trouble. I ruined my hips. I had, I have had hobbies that have cost me daily, just economically, and uh, I really burned the candle in both ends. And sometimes it gave a lovely light. And um, that comes actually from Christopher Hitchens. Uh, my hero Christopher Hitchens said when he got esophageal cancer after drinking and smoking and eating too much for years, uh, I burned a candle in both ends and it gave a lovely light. And in a way, yeah, many things I did gave a lovely light. And I had fun, but it had a price, a big price. Now, I want to talk about something that was also the talent thing. It is my parents. My mother is very creative. My father is very creative. My brother is creative. And my daughter is creative. So this creative gene, this curiosity, comes from my upbringing. Or was, you know... It's not that it, epigenetically I am a creative person, but I also had parents that kind of uh, enhanced that thing with the way they gave me the freedom to be myself. And I would say to my parents, thank you so much for being such beautiful parents because I have really beautiful parents. And I want to say that to them, uh, despite that my mother is going to hate that I'm now drinking a glass of wine when I talk about this. On my birthday, I have parents that has taken care of this big baby. Uh, the, and I, I really screwed up and they have been there kind of taking me when I fall and maybe they sometimes shouldn't have my brother said well you shouldn't have kind of been there all the time you should have let them fail much earlier but they also gave me as I, as I joke around with my mother she sometimes I'm very political okay I have I'm very opinionated and sometimes my mother think it's too much and she tries to kind of shut me up and, and stuff. And I say, well, you taught me to be an independent, independent person by the way I was, my upbringing, being able to get the amount of love that I got, get the amount of support, and also being uh, thought or being, uh, what do you say, uh, being... Um, um, told the the importance of following your own dreams, intuitions, and not really compromise, unless, of course, you are totally wrong, you should compromise, but that you should trust yourself, and that is actually, I'm disagreeing a little bit about that trusting yourself, because you are wrong, you shouldn't trust yourself, you should trust science or knowledge, so that's a conflict, but uh, 
my mother can say to me, oh, you should stop thinking so much. And I always say, well, do you have the off button? You know, when you are a thinking person, you can't really stop thinking. The, the, my brother says so. He thinks and thinks and thinks. My, my daughter is the same thing. She thinks and thinks and she thinks. Actually, my father is a little bit, I think so, because I have a very good relationship to my father. We have a very open relationship, like my mother and... and, and but, but we have this amazing friendship and, and uh, a very good relationship. But he is more toned. He is more, ah, it doesn't really matter. My mother is just, whoa. And me, whoa. And I inherited her extreme personality, like being all over the place. She is also more controlled than me. There is no doubt about that. But then I also... And I didn't inherit my father's calmness, but I inherited his testosterone level and the aggression part of him that he also has, and also the kindness and stuff like that. So, so all this this um, uh, talent thing comes from a mix between a genome that gives me the ADHD, the hypomania, and the bipolar disorder, which I totally disagree with is a disorder. It, just, it is just the warrior gene, the thing that makes you burn a little bit brighter. And uh, if you can get that under control, you have... You still have problems, but you have an enormous amount of a sea of possibilities because if you can really get your mind focused on important things there is no limits to what you can achieve and my view on the talent thing is that every human being has talent to do anything but what you also need is quite a good childhood that doesn't destroy your self-esteem but also doesn't give you the Dunning-Kroger syndrome so you think everything you do is good which I was probably suffering from when I made this or maybe it was just ignorance or the lack of introspection anyway so, as I said in the beginning, talent is a thing we say about people who has done the dirty job. We can't know which child that is a talent for anything. The Chinese tried that, it fails. You can teach any child to be a good pianist, but be to become a virtuoso, you have to feel it. It's like when I doing brushwork, I feel it. When I'm listening to piano music, I feel I can hear the voice of the pianist, how they were thinking, why they did what I did, they did, and uh, it is a form of empathy that kind of gets me close to them as people or persons or whatever and uh, if you don't have that empathy which is actually empathy I don't think you can ever understand what brushwork is all about and um, the creative process is all about it's if it is about I had a friend many years ago and I told him that I would like to learn how to play the piano, a thing I dream about doing still. And I should do it because life is short. 
and I just want to learn how to play. I'm not going to become a pianist. But with my manic personality, that is the danger. I know I objectively can never become a pianist, but if I start doing it, I will probably try. And that's a ridiculous thing, so I should actually focus on my writing and my painting. Anyway, uh, I think I lost the thread a little bit there. But the point is, yeah, yeah, he said, when I said, I want to learn how to play the piano, because I love piano music. And he said, ah, he said, why don't you just learn a couple of tunes so you can impress the girls in the parties? And he was also a painter. And I thought, you know, you really don't get it. And what happened to him was he just stopped painting because he didn't have the passion. He didn't, the, his drive was getting the girls, getting the money, getting the fame. And that can never drive you. You have to be driven by the feeling, by the chasing, getting it right. That is what has to drive everything. So, um, yeah, that was my parents, I owe them a lot, they stuck with me, and as I said if, uh, to my mother and my father, if I could, was pregnant with me, and I could look into the future, and I uh, could see how this would turn out, I would actually have an abortion. So, why create? Why create? That question is very simple. Why live? Why live? Why exist? My life is basically a blip in reality. It's just a blip in a vastness of an infinite multiverse, probably. And being here, being conscious for this short blip of infinity, is just ridiculous in itself. But what, what will you do with this life? Are you going to sit around eating chocolate pudding and watch Netflix until you die? Will that make you happy? I don't think so, because people don't look happy. There's a lot of, lot of entertainment, but people do not seem to be happy. No matter how much entertainment and food and short bursts they get, they never seem to become content in any way. And <clears throat> I would say, why create? That is a simple thing, because it makes life livable. Not worth living, but livable. When you wake up in the morning and you have this existential crisis and you start creating, you f get this delusion of life being meaningful and you just want more of it. So if there is any good reason to create, it would be because it makes life livable. Not worth living, but livable. And then it might make it worth living also, because, I mean, you exist, you are born into uh, existence, you didn't ask for it, it, it doesn't have an inherent uh, uh, meaning, Life is actually meaningless. There is probably not an afterlife. This is it. If you don't use this life to anything positive, there is actually absolutely no meaning at all. So, despite that I know I'm fucked, I'm trying to make life livable. Now, I need to turn off the camera and turn it back on because it's a half an hour and that's what my camera takes. So I just see you in the next segment. Okay. Hallelujah. Uh,
Why is this so bloody difficult? I've got to stop anyway. Okay, there we are again. Uh, 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 uh. So, my daughter always tells me that I need to get some nicer pants. <clears throat> I guess I should. Anyway, okay, so we were into this Y Create. Uh, and uh, that is very easy to explain. Why live? So, there you are. And <coughs> now, <coughs> probably COVID. <laughs> Cheers. I'm actually drinking a Chianti, and uh, it's really good. It's really, really good. I got it off a friend of mine, and uh, probably one of my parties. Um, and I decided today to drink this bottle after I talked to my parents actually uh, later, earlier today and as I said to my mother I haven't quit drinking but I have become the master of drinking uh, this doesn't control me anymore I control this and that is where you want to, want to go and uh, when you get control of this, you actually, this becomes a good thing. Because there wasn't a time where I didn't have that control. And that is why I'm going to go to the next topic here. And it's called Artist and Addiction. You know, I crossed out, I couldn't really decide, but I want to talk about to, especially if you're a young artist, I'm going to tell you my story with alcohol. It was actually alcohol. I never fell for like um, hash. I don't like the down thing. I like the up thing. So if I would use any drug, it would probably be amphetamine or cocaine, but Alcohol did it for me. I never, I tried cocaine, I tried hash, I tried other things too. Like, uh, one thing I actually enjoy is uh, MDMA. I've done that twice. And uh, the times I did that, I didn't feel any hungover or anything the day after. I just felt a little bit liberated actually. But I think if you do that too many times too, that will probably turn against you and destroy you. So you see people using it every day and stuff and just bullshit. You shouldn't use it more like a once in a half a year or once in a year to maybe rearrange your brain a little bit. But anyway, for me it was alcohol. And it started so subtly because I was, when I was young, I was training a lot. I actually remember I was probably in um, 14 years old and I was with a friend of mine in, in a school called Willy. He sadly has some problems with uh, drug addiction and stuff like that today, but uh, that was kind of predictable. Uh, but we were in Stavanger uh, because his brother went to um, gymna gymnasium. Uh, it's kind of a, um, well, whatever, kind of a, um, what do you call it in America? Call it um, college? Yeah, something like that. Anyway, and we had some beer and uh, the first day we had beer and I didn't kind of like it that much. But the day after, we had another beers the day after, and I just felt great. I, I can't get that feeling out of my head. I remember it like it was yesterday. I can almost smell it, you know. I can almost smell the feeling. And uh, we had such a great time, me and Billy, down there. And we drank, what is the name of that beer again? It was um, um, 
This is Stavanger of Beer in Norway. Um, oh God, I can't remember the name. But anyway, it's a Norwegian beer. Um, uh, maybe I get it later. <clears throat> anyway, uh, and I remember saying to my friend Willy that you should be careful with your drinking because it's going to turn into an alcoholic before you leave, before you are like 16. And actually he was probably already or getting there when we were 14. And of course, um, but I started training a lot and I did a lot of uh, martial arts, karate, a little bit of boxing and uh, I basically stopped drinking uh, for a while. But when I got, back, got into art school, it started slowly. It started a little bit before that with actually this girl. And it was actually my fault, not her fault. Uh, like it went to maybe twice a weekend or something like that. Once or twice a weekend. And before that I was kind of usually driving because I was training so much and I was doing competition. But as it progressed, it progressed into, uh, I went first into art school. I more and more stopped training because I went from another city, from Haugesen to Stavanger. And I didn't, I did stop the, the karate training. And I also more and more stopped training. And this more and more took over. So first it was like once a week. Then it was like Friday and Saturday. And after art school, I remember it was so beautiful. We had this Friday party in art school. And I always used to, um, what is that TV series again with um, lunch or something? Um, David Lynch made a TV series, um, very good one, anyway, it was in the 80s, in the 90s, beginning of the 90s. Anyway, I was always drinking a couple of bottles of wine on the Friday thing, and I was always, always going in and seeing this, this TV series and going back to the party, and it was such a great time, but then after art school, when I didn't have to go to school anymore, it started to skyrocket. And what happened was, you know, when you have the artist brain, okay, and you have the hypomania and the ADHD, that, that driving force. This drug, because it is a drug, really makes you high. Right now, I'm really high. I feel incredibly great. Uh, because this enhances the dopamine receptor in my brain so it gives me all the things like this that I will use hours to get while painting or training or basically dancing, having sex, whatever, doing creative work. It will take more time to get there. Well, sex is <laughs> probably more easy because it doesn't really take hours. Well, with me sometimes it actually do, but that is another video uh, but what happens is that this basically hijacked the part of me more and more it hijacked the part of me that fell in love with drawing and painting and it took over the part of training and then it started to hurt my health. I started to gain a lot of weight. The, 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 I'm 170 centimeters high, tall. And uh, the worst thing I was on the scale was 96 kilograms. 
And when I used to do competition with karate and stuff like that, I was like 66 kilos when I was doing the competition. And usually it was between 68 kilos and 70. Now I'm like 75. So, and I managed to do that because of my fasting and, and using my mind to, to, to lose some weight. I have still five kilos left probably but that is not a video uh, the the point is that this drug took over and I went from getting the high to getting basically addicted to this I didn't drink in the morning I drank like one two or three times a week and I have all my diaries, I have a lot of diaries that, that tells the story. Actually, it started with uh, one comment about alcohol in one of my diaries, all the way back to 1991 or 92, where I say, oh, I didn't drink this weekend, and I get so much, got so much done, and I feel great about it. And that was the first time I mentioned alcohol in my diaries. But for 20 years, Basically, 15 or 20 years, I was fighting not to drink. I would say 15 years was the worst, but I would say I got more control in the middle of my 40s. I'm now 53 today, as I say. So I used, I used three years to get an alcoholic problem. But I used basically 15 or 20 years to get it under control. I never went out on the deep end. I never became a real alcoholic. But it destroyed my health. It destroyed my painting progress. It destroyed my economy. It destroyed my psyche. It destroyed so many things for me, this drug. Uh, and... I know what abstinence is. You know, abstinence is when you are saying no, 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 no for a whole week and then you basically drink a bottle of wine in 40 minutes with a couple of whiskeys and you go out in the city and you keep on drinking and you get into fights and negativity. And then when I used came home, what I used to do was, in the end, I planned for the downfall. I was planning how to cope with the uh, with, uh, uh, negativity. So I bought food and I ate a lot of food and sometimes I even purged it after doing it and I went to sleep and I watched a lot of videos and stuff like that. So what I want to talk about when it comes to artists and addiction is if you're a young artist now if I could give one advice to young artists, do not fall for this art artistic thing about partying and, uh, you know, this myth about uh, being, a, what do you call it, being a, Uh, there's a name for it when artists drink and stuff. I can't really remember now, but okay, probably alcohol. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, bohemian, yeah, bohemian, being a bohemian. Forget about it. If you want want to make your art into something, you have to make this the slave, and you the master, and you have to plan when to do it, and you have to do it when you have time for it. You mustn't do like me and ruin basically years, years of time that could be put into good progress. Don't do that. Think about every hour as a, as, it's not that time is money. Time is life. Every time you waste your time, and all the, vi all the TV series I saw, all the depression, all the anxiety, all of the overtraining I did because I was so annoyed because I had been doing this and I felt like shit. And there's one more thing too. 
I never had much self-esteem. I was a little bit pushed out in school and I had these scars in me, kind of scars on my soul. My daughter actually experienced the same thing. My mother experienced something that kind of looks like that, but she was also a strong girl, but she also felt like a little bit on the side. I felt very much on the side and so did my daughter. And this leaves you with a personality that make you more susceptible for uh, basically addictions and stuff like that because you are trying to compensate for the low self-esteem. But the low self-esteem has a bright side, which is very good. If you actually start doing creative work and you start chasing something you want to make better this bad self-esteem will always keep your feet on the ground eh, you know when you have become conscious because when I paint when I draw this I wasn't conscious I wouldn't call myself a conscious being when I made this. I was of course more conscious than a chimpanzee but I wasn't a real conscious being. What happens when introspection is turned on and you start to see yourself from the outside and you start having objective standards like I do like like Rembrandt or Vermeer or Leonardo da Vinci or the best in art and the best in music then you have the objective standard to view your own work up against. And then you get, of course, then the bad self-esteem kicks in because you can't really compete with these people. You can just try to do your best and try to use your time to come become the best person you can possibly become. So yeah, maybe that was a digression. Uh, anyway, be extremely careful with drugs and alcohol. If you, if you have an ambition, if you really love creating, be really, really careful with alcohol, with addiction, how you use your time. And for heaven's sake, don't do like me. Don't spend millions of kronor on hotels in New York and partying just because you're trying to buy yourself some self-esteem because in the end you have to do a lot of work that you wouldn't do if you saved your money so look at saving your money as a way to get the freedom to do the art you want to to evolve freely now, I'm from Norway, and it's the best country in the world to live in. So there is no need for anyone not to succeed in this country. And uh, that is why I have the insight to blame everything, every single thing that went wrong, is my fault and everything I have done when it comes to my paintings so every every positive thing I've done is due to my hard work and of course the support I had from my parents and uh, and stuff like that because we love them it's, it's like J Jordan Peterson says this is a very good way you have to to first of all you have to treat yourself like somebody you love you have to give yourself the same advice and follow the same advice that you would tell a person you love that he should follow so uh, i think i lost some thread there yeah and there was a second thing you said um which I, of course, suddenly forgot. 
And that's okay, because that is life. Uh, Lars Brain. Uh, yeah, that is maybe uh, the thing that I'm getting into now, because I was starting to talk about Jordan Peterson. I really like Jordan Peterson's philosophy. Uh, remember, these videos are done just right on cough. I haven't really planned them, so I just talk. Some of you will find it interesting. But a lot of shit has happened to me basically the last year, plus minus a couple of months. And uh, I have to deal with a lot of struggle. Uh, COVID made it worse, uh, but there is a silver lining. It's almost like when you have to deal with things that are so... When you lose basically all control, and it, things are out of your control, because I'm, I'm kind of a control freak. I like to control, I like to control my weight, my, what I eat, I want to control things around me. I guess most people want to have some control, but things happened in my life where I basically the control was taken out of my hands. I don't want to go into what it was, but my friends know, and uh, that's, that's how it is. And. Uh, but this, I've been fighting so much, I would say almost the last eight years. And I would say that I, I had my share of everything. I've had some really beautiful girls in my life that I sadly couldn't manage to give my whole being to. And it drove some of them nuts. Some of them I'm very good friends with still. And that's a good sign, of course. Then I fell deeply in love with another girl. And she... Yeah. Things happened and she wasn't... Well, it didn't turn out well. And um, then I started to... Because of my overtraining, my eating habits, my my lack of sleep, my, my, I burned a candle in both ends. I just went into what I would call an emotional adonia. Uh, and I also got this thing with the thyroids when the hormones dropped, be, probably because of the stress. And then, of course, my hips started to hurt and they hurt for many years until I did something. In the end, I couldn't really walk. I remember on my 50th, 50th birthday, we were down in the city after having a party here. And the alcohol made my hips stiffer because you get kind of uh, drained for, for fluid. So I almost couldn't walk and it was so painful. Then I did my double hip replacement and I started to feel good again. And then something just happened. Uh, which was a result of all my mistakes, uh, recklessness, and um, for a whole year I've been fighting basically to stay afloat. And it has this beautiful silver lining. And I remember there was a was an American author that got AIDS in the 80s, and that was a death sentence. And he said, uh, awareness is heightened, but something else is lost. And it led me to a type of humility and a type of introspection, a deeper, even deeper introspection. And it made me becoming a stoic. And I think the combination between all the lockdowns and it tore me, I couldn't go to the city anymore, I couldn't do all these things. And I'm kind of a person who likes to meet people in the city because I don't like, you know, I kind of, 
home, you know, having people visiting and stuff. It's like I have my days are kind of cramped. So, but it made me go into Stoic philosophy. Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epicurus, and of course, John Peterson and many other philosophers. And I just realized that what I have to go for, for the rest of my life, for the rest of my life, to really put the rest of my life into something really positive, to get all my paintings done, or at least the things that I know is called um, doing a huge thing called the human condition, the art of painting. I have a, bio, a self biography I want to write. I have the human condition book I want to write. And I want to take all my diaries and put them into um, uh, book form or write them into a book so my actually as I said to my daughter I hope you don't burn them when you when I die but my writing is, I write both with my left and right hand so my writing may be like um, uh, deciphering hieroglyphics <laughs> so I'm gonna make it easier for her or people in the future who want to read how it is to have this addictive mind so I'm going to do that, and when I've done these things, I could die with a good conscience. And when I've done these exhibitions and done these projects, all the other time that comes after that will be a bonus for me. But all the hardship, all the struggle, all the things I've been dealing with had made me into a better person more conscious person, nicer person, and it made me realize what is important in life. And it's not short bus, it isn't the new girl, it isn't the food, it isn't the alcohol, it isn't a kick of training, it isn't a... These are just things that are positive. As I said to my father actually today, that if I never had sex again, if I never had another girl again, that would be the least of my problems. What I want to see done has nothing to do with short bus. What I would like to see in my life before I close my eyes, it's a sort of peace of mind and just not being happy necessarily, just being content. So, I would recommend Stoic, becoming a Stoic. If you're a young artist or you're an artist, stop the short bus and go for Stoic thinking. Read meditations of Marcus Aurelius, listen to Jordan Peterson, Listen to Epicurus and Seneca and all the other Stoic philosophers and you will realize that what is important is deep thinking, deep introspection, real relationships and the occasional glass of Chianti that makes it burn a little bit brighter sometimes. This was an hour long video. I hope you got to know me a little bit while listening. I hope you can leave a comment in the description. I hope you can share my videos on social media. If you want to support my work, you can actually go to Patreon and sign up for a dollar or five or fifteen or whatever, and I will try my best to teach you how to paint. I'm a nice person, I'm a good person, and I will treat you nicely. And uh, you are me, and I am you, and uh, that is why we should all try to do our best. And with this, I say happy birthday to me, and I hope to see you on Patreon or on YouTube. 
or wherever I see you. So, good luck. And now it's counting down.